Hi, I'm Maria Thea Harris or Velosos on social media. Welcome back to the Sub 50 podcast on Soul Gunner Style. And it's the top 20 countdown. Grab a cuppa and relax with us. Which their fabrics are very nice, but they are on the pricey side. People would say that they're good quality, but I'm making up a, a what has become known as a wearable toile. That wasn't even a thing back in the day. But no. it is. <laughs> it's just you made a first version it wasn't didn't have a name and i've got some nice fabric that i got from the famous man outside sainsbury's in walthamstow market and it's really nice fabric he said it was wool we had some wool but it's very fine wool and i don't disbelieve him because i've had some really lovely quality fabrics from him i think he gets them from the factories and manufacturers in his mm. area and he's able to get top quality fabrics which are obviously what they don't need in their workrooms. That's Susan Young. She's the original blog writer for Server 50. This was the second podcast with Susan in 2020 and today's episode is number eight in the top 20 countdown. You'll find Susan on Instagram under Susan Young Sewing. Since 2020 there's been a decline in the bricks and mortar fabric shops available to us. However finding fabric both in real life and online still has the same challenges and Susan talks about those in this podcast. Susan is a sewing tutor at Backstitch Shop and is a FAF UK ambassador. Thank you again, Susan, for being a great friend, for being part of the London Frocktail crew, for giving your time to Sava 50 and to Soul Gunnar Style Podcast. Let's get started. Hi, Maria. How are you? Good. How are you? Yes, not too bad, still surviving, <laughs> thankfully. <laughs> it's good to hear that things are picking up now. Yeah, it feels like we're, there's a bit of normality returning to the UK now, just gently. Not, not all countries, though. Wales and Scotland are still slightly more locked down than England, but people are starting to venture out again a bit more, which is good. It feels a bit more normal when you're out in the streets, although the shops aren't open yet, but I think they'll follow fairly soon. Let's keep our fingers crossed for that. <laughs> so today we're going to talk about your most recent blog post for we Sober are. 50. It was all about buying fabric when it comes down to it. That's right. It started off that Judith and Sandy were approached by a follower who queried, who asked whether anybody else had had the problem that she did where she'd bought some fabric and she'd spent time making a beautiful garment with it that she was very happy with. And then after two or three goes through the wash, the fabric had turned into something really rubbishy and it was so disappointing and she didn't know whether it was as so often is the case with sewing was it something she'd done well rarely is it or was it the fabric in the first place so that prompted the discussion on the sew over 50 feed of is there any such thing as cheap fabric is it always rubbish or Therefore, is it better to spend more money on fabric? Is expensive fabric always good? So there were a huge range of comments on the post and cheap over expensive was just one of the points that came up. So I waded in early on because... Having been sewing for, oh crikey, about since the age of 11, so that's 46 years, I think. It means that over that time, I've sewn with a massive number of different fabrics. And you can't quickly learn some of the things and some of the experiences that I have in that amount of time to know whether the fabric you have in your hand is a good fabric or not. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. And just so that our listeners understand, your sewing experience is more than just someone who sews for themselves. That's right. So over the years, I have worked in bridal and evening wear was my specialist background. I worked for an evening wear company when I first left college. And then when my children were small, I worked for a small bridal company near where I live. And that was, we used to use some beautiful fabrics there, not super high end, but nice fabrics. So I've worked with fabrics across the spectrum, really. So in my day to day sewing, Back in the past, I didn't have a lot of money to spend on fabric, so I had to choose wisely. 
there wasn't the amount of choice then because home sewing, home dressmaking was really in the doldrums. After I left school, it started to be a topic, a subject that was not being taught properly any longer. I'm sure many people who are listening to this will identify with that. We had a good education in needlework and the younger sewers who are coming along didn't necessarily. So unless they had a, somebody like their mum or their gran or an auntie to teach them, the newer sewers are coming at it with nothing really to base their choices on. Yeah. Other than the media that are feeding them images of beautiful fabrics and they've got money to spend so they want to spend it. They're being convinced that an expensive fabric it may not be what it is appearing to be at times. And particularly with internet shopping, what is even more so at present, it's very difficult to tell whether the fabric you're buying is as good as it ought to be for the price. To my mind, if I'm spending about £20 a metre, I'm not sure what that would be in dollars, but £20 a metre is quite pricey. It's around about $40 a metre here, I is think. Is it? So yeah. that, that would be pricey? Yes. Um, I would expect that to be a decent quality fabric. And that isn't always the case, I don't think. Yeah. I think you can get bargains. There are lots of ways of doing that. Just because they're cheap doesn't mean they're rubbish. This is such a difficult thing to try and explain to newer sewers, isn't it? Do you, it do you is. find yourself ever trying to? I haven't had to really explain it, but my purchase preference are remnants because that's mm. where I can apply my understanding of what is a good quality fabric over one that isn't, especially when it's the last part of the roll. And because yeah. I'm short, I can get <laughs> some value out of it. That's why I love remnants and it's a challenge. However, the reason I wanted to make sure that our listeners understand your background is because you do have quite a depth of knowledge and understanding of what a good fabric is, what good fabric value you can find if you understand fabric fibres, weave, and the things that manufacturers can put into fabric that can make it seem good quality, but after a couple of washes, like, mm -hmm. you know we've already seen it ends up looking like a thin dish rag and that's not what you yeah. bought no it isn't they can be quite artful and it's always been like this this isn't a yes. modern thing it's not new it's always been like this that there will be manufacturers of fabric that are just cheap as chips they will use a lot of dressing sort of starch or the dye itself will make it seem like a decent cloth with a bit of body to it as i said in the post in the blog post after a couple of washes that comes out and then it turns into a dish rag and it's really not very good things that have got so polyester cotton used to be about all you could get we're talking about 15 20 years ago when home sewing was really in the doldrums in my experience and i can only talk from my experience obviously living in an area that doesn't have a textiles heritage then I could only get what was in the shops locally. The reason I say about textiles heritage is because in the UK, there are areas up in the north, more specifically, where they had the cotton trade. There was a lot of woolen cloth produced and also in Scotland, in the islands. I touched on this in the blog. Yes. So people in those areas had the mill shops and things that they could probably go to and get wonderful quality fabrics when the rest of us weren't able to. But you touched on buying remnants and mill shops and had bargains because they've got the ends of rolls, they've got bolt ends, um, ends of lines. Yeah. All of those things you can get in those shop, in those places and they're probably going to be jolly good value now that doesn't mean they're cheap though it just might mean they're cheaper correct than their original cost so it depends what you want your textile your fabric for and then you have to weigh up whether that's a good price and you want to snap it up whether it's still a little bit pricey, but you know that it is such good value for what it is, mm. that it's also worth having. So I can see you're wearing your beautiful um, Chanel French style jacket there. <laughs> and you can get some gorgeous tweed fabrics, like Linton tweeds here in the UK, who make 
for Chanel have done for decades. Yeah. And they make beautiful uh, fabrics and you can buy directly from them still. So you could make yourself your own jacket in a fabric that you know a Chanel jacket could also be made in. And they're not cheap. They're, I don't know, I'm guessing now probably between 60 and 80 pounds a metre, maybe. Maybe not as much as that directly. Direct, because I've been looking at the Linton Tweet website. Oh, yes. They range from about 42 pounds and as low as 18 pounds a metre. Okay, so that actually, yeah, yes. I think that's very reasonable for the quality they're likely to be. So the, the 18 pound ones, they, they've only usually got a couple. And then I'm speaking from my experience here in Australia, when I've bought from them, they'll be here within four days. Really? Yes. That's impressive. <laughs> I'm happy I don't buy that often but you know they sit there yeah. and and then when we came to the UK uh, probably six years ago now or more we actually went up to Carlisle and I bought a few pieces from the shop. Gosh I've never been I must admit yeah. there was a period of time where I wasn't sewing quite a long period of time where I wasn't sewing so I wasn't going to places like that looking for fabric whereas now it's it's become my my big hobby is going out looking at fabric. And don't get me wrong, I don't always buy. Just because I go out, it's like a, a almost a spectator sport <laughs> to go out and, and just stroke fabric and see fabric. And I love to go with my friends and I'm a terrible enabler. So if I go fabric shopping with friends, quite often they'll come home with more than me. But they like to, I find they like to pick my brains and I'm about fabric and I'm more than happy to do that. I just love looking at fabric, discussing fabric and just sharing that interest, that hobby, that activity with my sewing friends, my new sewing friends. Yeah. Because most of them are younger than me. <laughs> We're all different ages and it's good yeah. that we all can communicate about the same thing, which is fabric and sewing. So it's lovely. So Susan, in your blog post, you brought up, your general rule of thumb and there were three points that you suggested people should think about when they're buying fabric yes these are the ones that i apply and i think you could anybody else could as well so the first one and i think it's the most important one is do i like it and so if you like it then you're already halfway towards thinking i might buy it but then i think the next one you really should consider is is it fit for the purpose that I intend it to, to use it for? And this one is, is one of those areas where you start to learn what is appropriate for what you want to make with it. So you might pick something to make a jacket with, but then discover that it's just too thin or it's the opposite, much too thick, or is it going to fray really badly? Or if I want a waterproof jacket, is this fabric waterproof? If it isn't, can I make it waterproof? There's a number of factors it's good to take into account. If you're just simply making a blouse or a top, then you probably don't need to consider these things. But if you're starting to get into the more experimental to push yourself more with the techniques that you're learning, you will start to encounter. So if you're going to make yourself a jacket or a coat there's very different techniques or evening wear there's very different criteria start to need to be applied to having a successful make at the end of it yeah. so I'm not saying that you shouldn't experiment because you can that's what designers do they push the boundaries but designers tend to do it within knowing what kind of result they're likely to get whereas a, a fairly inexperienced sewer might come at it thinking oh, well, I'll just try this fabric for that. And then they work really hard and make what well, is technically a lovely garment, but actually is not fit to go out in. And then that's so upsetting when you spend so much time on it. So I really do urge you to consider what is fit for the purpose. Do some research because again, it might come down to, well, how much do I spend per meter on the fabric required for this item? Let's say a jacket. Do you spend a lot of money on a beautiful linton cloth or do you have a look round and see if you could do it in something else you could do it in, in a corduroy or a chino or or something to be honest i'm making a jacket at the moment and it's the first time i'm making this pattern and i don't want to cut it straight away in the cloth that i bought because i did invest in some lovely corduroy from merchant and mills 
which their fabrics are very nice, but they are on the pricey side. People would say that they're good quality, but I'm making up a, a what has become known as a wearable toile. That wasn't even a thing back in the day, it's but not. it is now. <laughs> it's just you made a first version it wasn't didn't have a name and I've got some nice fabric that I got from the famous man outside Sainsbury's in Walthamstow Market and it's really nice fabric he said it was wool we had some wool but it's very fine wool and I don't disbelieve him because I've had some really lovely quality fabrics from him I think he gets them from the factories and manufacturers in his mm. area and he's able to get top quality fabrics which are obviously what they don't need in their workrooms so I've got this fabric which will look perfect and it does have a nice amount of body but it is very fine so I've actually had to mount it onto something else. I'm mm -hmm. backing it onto lining. I'll do a post about it eventually, so you'll get to see what I'm talking about. In other words, the first fabric I want to use is not entirely appropriate mm -hmm. for the pattern. Yeah. But I have a technique in which I can give it more body. I can make it more suitable. And I'm hoping that it will turn into a successful garment. My final criteria is, do I really need it? So, <laughs> That's my favourite. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. I, you, in the end, only the individual can decide they really need it. Because need, no, probably not. But want, mm, that's another, another matter, isn't it? Yeah. That in, comes down to being the individual choice. So if you know in your heart that you don't need it, then walk away. I am quite good at walking away I don't often just make a completely rash purchase that I regret I've got a couple of things but they're not generally expensive so near to me there is there's a market and there's a chap there again I think he gets his fabrics from small factories and workrooms so the things that he has are he only has sort of four or five meters maybe a little more sometimes but I've had some terrific fabrics from him, really interesting prints on them, decent quality, and you can feel them. That's a whole new area that's opening up is a bricks and mortar shop yes. over online. We've had people on our podcast who have also said when they do online shopping, they get swatches. But then yeah. the issue there with swatches is by the time they end up making the purchase, the fabric's gone. Have they sold out? That is a tricky one. And I would always suggest, if possible, to get a swatch. That said, I don't tend to do it. But then I don't buy that much online. I do blog on behalf of a fabric company here in the UK. Yeah. And the reason I'm happy to do that is because I, I have seen them at a couple of shops shows so I've seen the fabrics at that time anyway because obviously there's new stock coming all the time I've seen the quality of the fabrics that they have yeah and I like the quality of what I saw then and I know that the fabrics that they have online are of good quality they're just a husband and wife team and they're so involved in the sewing community they want the customer to be happy they are very much about pleasing their clientele when it comes to online shopping as you say there's a lot of companies now setting up small companies setting up selling fabric it's hard to be i don't want to be critical at all because it's a terrific way of people very often women hmm. setting up and running their own business in a way that works for them they can work from home they've often got small children and they can run it alongside full-time work of some other kind completely so it's terrific that we as a community can support these small online shops and I gravitate towards the ones that first of all have the sort of fabrics that I like see the designs that I like to see and then when I know what the quality of their fabric is like, then I'm happy to support them mm. and to promote them. I don't get paid for it, but I do get provided with the fabric that I make the garments with. And I'm, I'm yeah. happy to do that. I make no apology for that because they're quality fabrics. And you get the freedom to be able to make something that you will wear and that you will be happy to wear. Yes, that's a really nice position to be in. And they also have quite a wide team of people, which is another reason I like being part of the team for that company, because they've got quite a broad base of experience and ages and interests and, and likes and dislikes in mm. fabric. So their blogging team is diverse, which I think matters. Yeah. Because if 
comes back again to the so over 50 issue doesn't it we want to see ourselves represented and I do tend that's why <laughs> why I put myself out there <laughs> Because above all, I love sewing and dressmaking and I love communicating that with other people and wanting to share the stuff I've learned. Because if I can prevent someone having an expensive disaster, hmm. then I would love to be able to do that. I want to be a critical friend, not just critical. Yeah. And that can be very difficult with online. I know it can. But I, I still love a bricks and mortar shop and I'm sure many people do because you'll get a level of support in a, a shop. Often they're run by a person or people who've had that shop for decades and it must be really tough for them right now, particularly if they don't have an online arm to the business. It's really lovely when you go to a retailer, fabric retailer. And it is family and, yeah. you know, you've known them for so long and I'm still really thankful that the family that run Minerva still allow me to do my monthly commitments. So I have no yes, problems great, with that. Yeah. How and long have they been running? Do you know? It was Vicky's mother who bought it because I think she was working there. So it's been handed from mother to daughter. Okay. I went there when I first started blogging for them and I met the whole family and all the people who work there. Mm. It's huge, but it's still a family company. Yeah. That really matters, doesn't it? Yeah. It really matters because I blogged for them as well. Not as often as you, but the email is always from Vicky. It's always, yes. and she replies personally, although you get the group email, she then always replies personally, doesn't she? And and you can yeah. feel like you're having a conversation with someone. And to me, that really matters. It's not a faceless big company. Yeah. When there have been instances that have happened locally that we hear about in Australia, I'll actually send a note to Vicky saying, are, are you guys okay? And she'll respond straight back mm. so that relationship is there and I'm happy to keep it that way yeah, yeah definitely yeah. so I'm fortunate in being close to London obviously I've got a wealth of shops and markets that I can go to and they're they're great but because not everybody has that you know particularly that's right Australia for example you could be hundreds and hundreds of miles from the nearest shop of any kind never mind a fabric shop so online is the only option for people so I'm not going to knock it in that respect because it really serves a purpose. It enables people to continue sewing and dressmaking in a way they wouldn't have been able to mm. in the past. They would have just had to wait until the next time they went to the big city, presumably, to buy everything they needed then. And then that was that. You know, we, we were spot with the luxury of being able to get on the laptop, tip-tap, tip-tap, and, and order what we require Mm. trims and things and then it all just arrives so there is a place for it and it's not going away no. but it's just different it's just different and I but I do hope that bricks and mortar shops are able to continue as well because nothing beats going in and feeling the cloth and chatting with the people that are in the shop and I think the key thing that came out of the post that went up and your blog post about purchasing is that within the Sober 50 account and the people who follow it, there's a wealth of people who follow it who can give you advice if you want advice. And I think that's, again, one of the beauties of being involved with a Sober 50 account. Yes, yeah, definitely. Because I'm always still learning things from my friends on there as well. So I wouldn't want anyone thinking, oh, she knows it all, because I absolutely don't. My area of expertise is quite different to some other people. I've hardly done any tailoring, for example, over my life, my career. So that, to me, is very much finding my way. But the difference is probably that because I've had a lot of other experience, I know what techniques I can probably bring into play yes. to enable a decent result. It won't be a complete disaster. So you're learning all the time we're yeah. always learning and I'm not afraid to ask the questions if I'm struggling with something or I'll just see someone else has done it a new way a different way and think oh actually I'll try that exactly yeah, yeah and exactly. I've got new techniques that my, my needlework teacher would have a fit if she knew I did some of the things that I do now but they work. They mean you can speed things up or you just get a better result or it's more pleasing, whatever. So you're always building and learning and uh, I'm really I'm keen to do that. And it's good to be, as I've said, it's good that if you're getting involved and if you're contributing to the Server 50 account, you can pick all that up 
and you don't have to be next to each other because you can DM yep. each other and get involved in the conversations. Yeah, very much so. Susan, we've covered so much already with your blog post and we've barely touched the depth of your blog post. So how about we continue on next week and talk about the rest of your blog post. That sounds good to me. Yep, I can do that. I can talk about fabric for as long as you like. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So thank you again for being on the So Organised Style So the 50 Daily Podcast. You're very um, welcome. Thank you for inviting me. That's, oh, look, always happy to have you, Susan. You know that. So have a lovely day, listeners. Bye. Bye. This episode of Savvy 50 Podcast on Soul and I Style was produced by me, Maria Thea Harris, with permission of Susan Young, sound by bensound.com. Many thanks for the ongoing support of this podcast Patreon contributors. Their ongoing monthly support enables me to develop this podcast for free. Make sure you direct message Sandy and the social media editors at Sober50 on Instagram to contribute to the ongoing posts and challenges the team promotes to the community of over 50,000 followers. You can subscribe to Sold and I Style Podcast, but with an S, not a Z, on all good podcast apps. Make sure you go back and listen to our free Sober50 Podcast archive from Sold and I Style Podcast. We look forward to joining you in your sewing room next time. Stay safe, everyone.